Since I took office seven years ago in the midst of crisis, I don't think I have ever been more optimistic about a year ahead than I am right now. I don't think politicians are natural crooks. Not all of them. No, I don't think most of them are. I think they are actors. And actors are neither men nor women. Actors belong to a third sex. Actors are actors. And one aspect of it is the political game. Hello? Selena, what are you doing? I thought you were the president. Hey, listen, are you going to this Snorrespondence dinner tonight? <laughs> no, I'm not going, man. I've been there once. It's a bunch of politicians trying to explain politics to Hollywood. It's not worth it. Exactly. Now, there's one thing you might have noticed I don't complain about. Politicians. Everybody complains about politicians. Everybody says they suck. Yeah! Well, where do people think these politicians come from? They don't fall out of the sky. They don't pass through a membrane from another reality. They come from American parents and American families, American homes, American schools, American churches, American businesses, and American universities, and they're elected by American citizens. This is the best we can do, folks. This is what we have to offer. It's what our system produces. Garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> if you have selfish, ignorant citizens, if you have selfish, ignorant citizens, you're going to get selfish, ignorant leaders. And term limits ain't going to be any good. You're just going to wind up with a brand new bunch of selfish, ignorant Americans. So maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the politicians who suck. Maybe something else sucks around here, like the public. And that's why they pay anchormen like Dan Rather $2 million a year. Because he doesn't question them. He knows that if he goes against them, he's going to lose $2 million a year. Do you think a man that looks pretty and sits in front of a TV camera for the 6 o'clock news is worth $2 million a year? No way. I don't care how long he works and I don't care what he does. There is no job worth $2 million a year. That's why they pay athletes these fantastic salaries. I was listening to the radio the other day. They just contracted to pay one, one player on one team $6 million a year. Can you believe this? And why is that? It's the Roman circus. What does the emperor do when the people become restive and when the people are asking questions and when the people don't like the policies of the emperor? He sends them to the circus. He creates a circus. He builds a giant coliseum. And he begins to throw the Christians to the lions. And he has great chariot races and football games and basketball games, all to keep the idiots preoccupied with things that don't mean anything in the scheme of the entire world. Uh, Central Bank works. It's constantly active politically. It's constantly planning for war. And the reason they plan for wars, like Ezra Pound said many years ago, uh, wars are created to make debt because uh, ordinary peacetime commerce can be profitable. Uh, goods are traded and uh, people are employed, but war gives you the big money. When you get into war, you have billions and billions. And of course, during World War II, we had a very interesting system uh, of production. It was called uh, cost plus, cost plus 10%. So the more money, if you were manufacturing munitions, boats or guns or whatever, for the government, the more money you spent, the more money you made. <laughs> so, so naturally you were very generous to your uh, uh, workers and you paid them enormous amounts of money because every time you gave them a raise, you made an extra 10% on the raise. So, <laughs> so and nobody balked at this, and this, this was what they called the miracle of production of uh, World War II. And all it was, they had unlimited funds from the government, and uh, of course they made their money, and uh, they got very rich. So, uh, in 1943, we did have a couple of successes, and Ezra Pound broadcast from Radio Rome at that time, and he said, uh, uh, well, you've had a couple of successes now, and you're scared out of your pants that the war is going to end. 
which of course they didn't want it to end in 1943. And that's why they fought World War II to prolong it as long as possible. They had the step-by-step uh, uh, -step approach in the Pacific. Instead of attacking Japan, they attacked each one of these little islands at tremendous cost. Well, it was, a, it was stupid, but it kept the war going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, if it attacked Japan, uh, it could have been over in a couple of weeks. That wasn't what they wanted. And it was the same way in Europe. Uh, they landed in Sicily and fought their way all the way up Italy through the mountains and so forth, uh, which kept things going an extra year. Because if they had attacked France or Germany uh, by land at that time, the war had been over in six months. But as they didn't want it that way, and so they prolonged it to 1945. Because if it's really just the fault of these politicians, then where are all the other bright people of conscience? Where are all the bright, honest, intelligent Americans ready to step in and save the nation and lead the way? We don't have people like that in this country. Everybody's at the mall, scratching his ass, picking his nose, taking his credit card out of his fanny pack and buying a pair of sneakers with lights in them. And in what free moments I can take right now, I'm working on my State of the Union address. It's my last one. And as I'm writing, I keep thinking about the road that we've traveled together these past seven years. Hey, do you want to come and pick me up? Come on! Yellow? Seriously, y yellow. Sports, sports, sports. Till the day they die, they're watching sports. They're watching international corporations that own massive sports teams where guys are paid millions of bucks each per year for throwing or kicking a ball around. Something you children do. Something you grow out of as you grow up. And they knew they'd do this because H.G. Wells talked about it a long time ago. Yeah. You see, when you take away your manhood, you, you, you only project it through someone else. Someone else who pre pretends at a weekend to be your tribe and he's fighting someone else. Because in your own life, you have no power at all. And you're putting on that fat gut with all the fast food you, you eat and the, and the booze you drink. But there you so that they don't have the time to learn what the truth is, so they don't ever get smart enough to learn how they're being manipulated, so they don't ever question the emperor. That's why they pay a player on a football team or a baseball team a million or two million or three million dollars a year. It is the Roman circus. I know men who don't know anything in the world except who plays third base for the Mets. And they think that's a great accomplishment. And they meet and pat each other on the back and bond and go have cocktails. And uh, it's a very unfortunate situation because when you see the price of college education in this country today, I think it's about 120000 for a four-year stint, and to realize that those students are being denied practically all information about what's going on, <laughs> it's really robbery of a very gross kind. But that's the way the system is operated. And uh, the reason is that all of these so-called Ivy League schools, like you have the Harvard School of Business, <coughs> the most prestigious business school in the United States. Well, J.P. Morgan had a partner in the First National Bank called George Baker. George Baker was president of the bank, and they worked together for many years. Of course, George Baker made hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, he gave $25 million to Harvard for the School of Business. And the name is right there today, George F. Baker School of Business, because he gave him all the money. Well, why did George F. Baker give $25 million to Harvard for the School of Business? Because he knew that the students there would never be told anything about what's going on. In other words, he made an investment. He made an investment in the future that uh, the students would never find out what, what, was act, what they were, had been doing. And that's true. The Harvard School of Business <coughs> was set up to return short-term profits. And anybody who's gone through the Harvard School of Business uh, and become head of a Fortune 500 corporation, which many of them do, has the worst possible training. Get in the car. Oh, shit. Oh, 
It's locked. Dad. Anybody, anybody looking? Just, just check for me. No. Oh, I'm gonna remember that. Oh yeah. Shh, 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 shh. Okay. Oh. When it comes to great steaks. I've just raised the stakes. The Sharper Image is one of my favorite stores with fantastic products of all kinds. That's why I'm thrilled they agree with me. Trump steaks are the world's greatest steaks, and I mean that in every sense of the word. And the Sharper Image is the only store where you can buy them. Change. Things must change for this cover. Our government, look at it. it it isn't too big to fail. It's too big to succeed. It's too big to succeed so we can afford no retreads or nothing will change with the same people and same policies that got us into the, the status quo. Another Latin word, status quo. The people I've met, the stories that you've shared, the remarkable things you've done to make change happen, to recover from crisis, and set this country on a better, stronger course for tomorrow. That's what makes America great, our capacity to change for the better. Are these washed? <laughs> Shave, then work out. That's how I do it. And I don't really need a reason. That's just how I do it. If I split open your underwear drawer, one brand, one color, my shoes are squeaking today, which I apologize. Is that embarrassing too? It is. I've got to try it out. Watch out, people! it's the greatest nation on earth and our leaders are the greatest leaders on earth but did you know there are other countries that are not america and each of them has a leader of its very own let's take a moment to meet one in our ongoing series other countries presidents of the united states this week's leader francois Hollande. francois holland francois Hollande. Uh, Fra frankie holland that's right, Francois Hollande, the president of France, the country where your cousin spent a three-month semester abroad and the rest of his life overemphasizing the word croissant. Interestingly, Hollande is rare among world leaders in that he's publicly questioned the existence of God, which perhaps explains why on his inauguration day, this happened. Hollande is on his way to meet with German Chancellor Angela Merkel in Berlin when his plane was hit by lightning. Hollande is also a committed socialist, not only believing that France should have a public investment bank and that the country's retirement age should begin at 60, but also that his body should be shared with as many French women as possible. Yes, Francois is probably most famous for his love life, which rivals that of France's notorious President Le Pew. We can do away with the dull preliminaries. Mm -hmm. Hollande had four children with Ségolène Royal, a fellow socialist who also ran for president, only to lose to Nicolas Sarkozy. Hollande chose to comfort his partner by leaving her for his younger mistress, Valérie Trinvailleur, an act so heartless, the French people decided to punish him by electing him to the highest office in the land. But wait, there's more. Hollande then cheated on his mistress with another mistress, sneaking out of the presidential palace to meet her for a rendezvous on a scooter, a sequence of events so stereotypically French, it's almost offensive. So tonight, we introduce you to Francois Hollande, a man who dumped a presidential candidate and became president himself, a man who evicted the first lady from the presidential palace, an action which somehow increased his approval ratings. And the only man in the world who's managed to pick up a gorgeous movie star mistress while riding around on a scooter. Who says there's no God? Until 1945. So, real strategy in a war is not how to win it, 
but how to keep it going as long as possible. And that is when you have a bank behind it, because the bank wants uh, to drag it out and uh, make it as costly as possible, not only in money, but also in human lives. I mean, they were gambling with American lives uh, when they prolonged the war and fought through the islands in the Pacific, fought up Italy. There was never, militarily, there was never any explanation that you could offer to justify this kind of campaign. And I guess Hitler knew what was going on anyway, because he was financed by the Bank of England. In fact, uh, they put out the myth that uh, the evil Hitler was financed by German industrialists, but in fact Hitler was disliked by the German manufacturing class, and uh, so he had to go to uh, Governor Montague Norman, governor of the Bank of England, uh, to get his money. And he was broke when he w went into office in 1933. So we had to fly a couple of lawyers to uh, Cologne to meet with him and to assure him that uh, he would get the money to keep him going. So, uh, you know, they have war crimes for t people like that. They had war crimes trials for people who plotted war. Well, the two war criminals in this case were John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles of the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, who were the lawyers for the international bankers. And the Dulles brothers went to Cologne and assured Hitler he would have money to keep the Nazi administration going. And uh, <coughs> he was actually financed too by the Schroeder Company of uh, London. And uh, one of the Schroeder directors, F.C. Tarks, was a director of the Bank of England. So he had the governor of the Bank of England and Tarks behind him. And with the money of the Bank of England behind him, Hitler was uh, assured of uh, having a Nazi regime and of uh, starting World War II, which was the whole plan anyway. Uh, they didn't care what Hitler did as long as he got to World War II going. And so that worked out and uh, that's how they had it. Without Hitler, there would never have been a Second World War, which means that the uh, bankers would have lost many billions of dollars in profits. So he was a good investment for them. You know, you're really beautiful. And a woman that looks like that has to have her own special scent. Oh, thank you. Maybe, maybe you could tell me what you think of this scent. Hmm, I like that. This, this may be the best of all. Oh, you dirty boy, you... Oh, oh! Donald, I thought you were a gentleman. Hm. You can't say I didn't try. The deadline for signing up for February 15th. February 15th. In many cases, you can get health insurance for less than $100 a month. Just go to healthcare.gov to figure out how to sign up. February. Kick it! Yeah! Now listen up, suckers. Don't get the jitters. But MC Rose has a heads off of critters. That's true. It's cruel to see. But he's going to be about animal cruelty. He's a man, he's a treasure trove. But tell me, what is your name? I'm MC Rose. That's right, he can't be beat because he's so white from his head to his feet. But he will rap it when you give him a chance. Look at him move, doing a rapping dance. That's true, he's a dancing resident. He is the sidekick to the president. He's going way above. Tell me, what is your name? MC Rose. That's true, he crossing his arms, he's rapping and a chilling and a showing his charms. He will do it or without fail. Get out his gun, cause he's shooting quail. This man will never stop. Look at him jumping up a daughter ready to hop. He's got some money. And Hosni Mubarak has been in power for more than 26 years. The United States has got a close and meaningful relationship with Egypt relationship is a cornerstone 
for a policy in the Middle East. A policy that includes giving Mubarak a giant aid package while looking the other way as he uses riot police and hired thugs armed with sticks, knives, swords and Molotov cocktails to keep the opposition from voting on election day. You might say about Mubarak, the same thing FDR said about another dictator. He may be a son of a bitch, but he's a son of a bitch. You see, we've had a policy of propping up dictators for more than 50 years now. Back when the Cold War started heating up, we decided to do whatever it took to stop communism from taking over the world. And the United States started mixing with a rougher crowd. In 1953, the CIA helped the Shah of Iran overthrow the Iranian government to become their supreme ruler. Sure, the Shah tortured or killed anyone who publicly disagreed with him, and even went as far as shoving broken glass up the nether regions of his critics. But he totally hated communism. Now, he was a son of a bitch, but he was our son of a bitch. The Shah kept Iran in our corner until 1979, when Ayatollah Khomeini's Islamic Revolution swept to power and held 52 Americans hostage for 15 months. That's when we made friends with Saddam Hussein over in Iraq. Now, he was an SOB, too. But for 10 years while he was fighting the Iranians, he was our SOB. In fact, by the mid 80s, we had sons of bitches all the way from Latin America to the Middle East. But hey, pimping freedom ain't easy. Shake what you, what you, what your uncle gave you. Uh. We needed to keep our SOBs happy and on our side. So we provided them with tanks, guns, planes, and mo money. Today we give Egypt more than $2 billion a year in weapons and aid. Sure, there's reports of torture, murder, and rampant political corruption, but somewhere along the way, we decided that in order to protect our own freedom, it was all right to sacrifice the freedom of others. Shake what you have got in the executive branch. Hey, guys. What are you doing? Nothing. What's in your mouth? Carrots? Hey, don't tell Joe. Haven't you guys listened to anything I said about healthy eating? When 150 of the most powerful men and women in the world can meet in secret in Baden-Baden, Germany and plot the fate of billions and nobody even cares about it. But six football players go to lunch together and it's in the headlines across the country. You have a reflection of the society in which that exists. And it is a sick, sick society that is doomed to self-destruction. So based on that scenario... And secondly, I don't vote because I believe if you vote, you have no right to complain. People like to twist that around, I know. They say, they say, well, if you don't vote, you have no right to complain. But where's the logic in that? If you vote, and you elect dishonest, incompetent people, and they get into office and screw everything up, well, you are responsible for what they have done. You caused the problem. You voted them in. You have no right to complain. I, on the other hand, who did not vote, who did not vote, who, in fact, did not even leave the House on Election Day, I'm in no way responsible for what these people have done and have every right to complain as loud as I want about the mess you created that I had nothing to do with. So I know that a little later on this year you're going to have another one of those really swell presidential elections that you like so much. You'll enjoy yourselves. It'll be a lot of fun. I'm sure as soon as the election is over, your country will improve immediately. As for me, I'll be home on that day doing essentially the same thing as you. The only difference is when I get finished masturbating, I'm going to have a little something to show for it, folks. <laughs> Thank you very much. So he was a good investment for them. And uh, so that's why they call him a monster today, because they don't want anybody to know about their association with him. Or, now they did try to indict Lieutenant General Schroeder, a German, uh, who was head of the SS uh, for war crimes after the uh, end of World War II. So he was arrested very briefly and held in a camp and uh, under British uh, jurisdiction and quietly dropped. He was never tried. And he was the man who made the whole Hitler Nazi administration possible. So uh, the war crimes trials, the Nuremberg trials, they were recently reshown again. Uh, and, and the only reason they ever held the Nuremberg trials was that they wanted to silence the uh, German generals who knew who had knowledge about all this 
duplicity and how the Bank of England had financed Hitler, well, they wanted to permanently silence them, so they hung them. And their crime was not war crimes at all, it was the fact they knew too much. And they were silenced, and uh, they managed to conceal uh, the background of what was going on. So this is how central banks work. They use everybody, and when they're through with you, they get rid of you by whatever means. They hang you, or, or uh, may you just disappear. And uh, so... Oh, this looks good. Mm. Oh, I just forgot my purse, so... I'm sure there are raisins in here. Mm. It's a fruit. Hey, girl. Hey, J-Dog, are you going to this dinner thing tonight? Well, hell no, I'm not going there. We've got important things going on here in the Capitol. Ooh, yeah. Okay, right. Thanks. That one. <laughs> you know, it's good to see so many influential guests here tonight. Justice Scalia, <laughs> Justice Alito. Yeah, all the usual suspects. Speaking of suspects, where's the great white hunter? I am sorry, Vice President Cheney couldn't be here tonight. <laughs> I agree with the press that Dick was a little late reporting that hunting episode down in Texas. In fact, I didn't know a thing about it till I saw him on America's Most Wanted. <laughs> Cheney, what a goofball. <laughs> Our capacity to change for the better. Our ability to come together as one American family and pull ourselves closer to the America we believe in. It's hard to see sometimes in the day-to-day -day noise of Washington, but it is who we are. And Larry David is hosting SNL this weekend. He does a pretty good imitation of you. Do you do an, a Larry David imitation? Anderson, I'm gonna, I know you've been in journalism for a long time. Uh -huh. Are you doing this your Larry is, David right now? Uh -huh. I am Larry David. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't get it. Status quo, another Latin word, status quo. And it stands for, man, the middle class, everyday Americans are really getting taken for a ride. <laughs> That's status quo. And GOP leaders, by the way, uh, you know, the man can only ride you when your back is bent. So strengthen it. <laughs> then the man can't ride you. American won't be taken for a ride because so much is at any example where I ever lied to the American people about my job, whether I ever let the American people down, and I had more support from the world and world leaders and people around the world when I quit than when I started. And I will go to my grave being at peace about it. And I don't really care what they think. Oh, yes, you do, They sir. have no oh, excuse idea. excuse me, Mr. President. You care. I can feel it across the room. No, no, you I care. You feel it very deeply. I care. You don't want to go here, Peter. You don't want to go here. Not Everything's set for tonight, Mr. Trump. I wonder what Trump's game is this time. Trump's got a new game. Trump's got a new deal. What's your game, Donald? Trump has a new game. What is it? It's an airline. A new convention. Yeah. It's an airline, Mr. Trump. It's it's Trump. Trump. It's Trump. 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 Mr. Trump, please. My new game is Trump, the game. Trump, the game where you deal for everything you ever wanted to own. Because it's not whether you win or lose. It's whether you win. Yeah. Play Trump. Our purple mountains with ramparts red glare. White with foam and justice for all, fruity plains gallantly streaming from sea to shining sea with a shining city on a shining hill above a shining prairie and maybe some shiny trees and a few shrubs, I see a shiny America. This is the Federal Reserve system that we uh, think is a unique American institution. And the Federal Reserve Bank of New York alone now, there are 12 banks, of course, 12 Federal Reserve Banks, but uh, the bank in New York is called the Money Center Bank, and that is the, uh, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York makes all the major decisions. 
Now, there was a piece in the paper yesterday about the uh, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And, uh, in fact, he's a, he's a minor figure. He has no authority whatsoever. All the power is in New York. But they try to promote the other 11 presidents of these other 11 banks uh, just to make them feel important, I guess. But uh, the Money Center Bank has always done everything. And it was the directors of this one bank in New York, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which uh, financed communism, and uh, they were active in helping the Nazis, and they were uh, active in helping the fascists in Italy. So all of these great political movements of the 20th century came right out of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And th that alone is uh, a historical fact which is very significant but if you send your uh, offspring to Yale or Princeton or Harvard, they will never hear one word about any of this. <laughs> so I don't care how much money you spend, they're not going to get this information. It's all a matter of record, but the professors know that they have very cushy jobs. They pay their professors very well now, about 150000 a year. They get long vacations. They get all sorts of special perks. Uh, uh, trips to uh, Europe for conferences and things like that. Their children all get scholarships at the best colleges. So uh, they're well taken care of. So they don't rock the boat. And they know to a T what they need to tell their students and what to keep from them. And of course... Green Acres is the place to be Farm living is the life for me. Land spreading out so far and wide. Keep Manhattan, just give me that countryside. The America we believe in. That's what's on my mind. While I'm writing, my team's cooking up new ways you can watch and engage with the speech, and I hope you'll all tune in next Tuesday night, because this address will be for you. Claire, uh, I'm not going to pay for that fucking wall. He should pay for it. He's got the money. If you got Are you afraid that he's going to be the next president of the United States? What would that mean? What would no, that mean for Mexico? No, no, no. Those performances are part of our culture, even though they are performances. Even though some of the actors themselves may be cynical about their performance. But what we have now cannot be excused in us. What's your name? Good to see you, Patrick. Oh my nice gosh. to meet you. I'm Ryan. Good to see you, Ryan. How I'm are you? I'm here and I'm so Good excited. To see you. Well, oh. Give me a hug. Oh. I'm glad you're excited. Oh. I'm, I'm can, we get a, can I get a picture? <gasps> yes, you oh can. Oh my gosh, it's like the best day of my life. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you got to get in there, oh, Ryan. Come on, Ryan. Come on. Oh, Pat, do you want one too? Come on, Pat. I'll get to see He'll take it. He'll take it. Oh my gosh. Someone's going to think you're like wax. Hey. Hey. What's going on, guys? This is an excerpt from a book called The Jungle, written by Upton Sinclair in 1905. And it's even more relevant now than it was over 110 years ago. Open your eyes and look about you. You have lived so long in the toil and heat that your senses are dulled. Your souls are numbed. But realize once in your lives this world in which you dwell. Tear off the rags of its customs and conventions. Realize that 
Out upon the plains of the desert tonight, two hostile armies are facing each other. That now, while we are seated here, a million human beings may be hurled at each other's throats, striving with the fury of maniacs to tear each other to pieces. And this, in the 20th century, 1900 years since the Prince of Peace was born on earth. 1900 years that his words have been preached as divine, and here two armies of men are rending and tearing each other like the wild beasts of the forest. Philosophers have reasoned, prophets have denounced, poets have wept and pleaded, and still this hideous monster roams at large. We have schools and colleges, newspapers and books. We have searched the heavens and the earth. We have weighed and probed and reasoned and all to equip men to destroy each other. We call it war and pass it by, but do not put me off with the platitudes and conventions. Come with me. Realize it, see the bodies of men pierced by bullets, blown into pieces by bursting shells. Hear the crunching of the bayonet plunged into human flesh. Hear the groans and the shrieks of agony. See the faces of men crazed by pain, turned into fiends by fury and hate. Put your hand upon that piece of flesh. It is hot and quivering. Just now, it was part of a man. This blood is still steaming. It was driven by a human heart. It is systematic, organized, premeditated, and we know it and read of it and take it for granted. Our papers tell of it, and the presses are not stopped. Our churches know of it and do not close their doors. The people behold it and do not rise up in horror and revolution. Or perhaps the desert is too far away from you. Come home with me then. Come here to earth. Held the knowledge of reality. Yeah. The kind of understanding that I've just been describing. Now imagine if you know that's how reality is, and the, the, you get the people, because of the way you structure the education system, and the, what we bravely call science, and the media, and all the rest of it, and religion, they think all this is real. They think this is who they are. They think that they see everything in terms of a partners instead of unity. You are in an incredible position of control, because you understand reality, and the people you are controlling and manipulating have not got a clue what reality they're experiencing. I mean, we reach uh, what, what we think is the cutting edge of human knowledge. It ain't really, it's de not definitely, but it's what we perceive it to be. And you go, oh yeah, we fly to the moon, and we've got nanotechnology, and it's really great. And then you stop someone, and you say, who are you? Where are you? What are you doing here? Well, and if they don't parrot some religious reaction to you, some religious belief system to you to answer to those questions, um, then they'll say, I don't know. We're at the cutting edge of human awareness in the 21st century as we perceive time, and we can't answer questions like, who are we, where are we, what are we doing here? What's going on? Um, the reason we can't answer that, what well, we can if we do the research and we open our consciousness, but the reason that vast numbers of people can't do that because the control system is structured so that from cradle to grave that knowledge is kept from them and the ability to expand consciousness and access their knowledge that way is suppressed and suppressed and suppressed and suppressed. Um, and, um, but what's, what's brilliant now is that this uh, control system is losing control. It may seem to be getting more control with more legislation and more police uh, imposition and militarization of the police and more data or surveillance. Yeah, in the play out world it seems to have more control. What it's losing control of is the fundamental foundation of its control and that is the sense of human perception that we are 
what they tell us we are instead of understanding what we really are. And the more that happens, the more control, the control system as it plays out in all those things will fall. Because it is going down. It's going to go forward for a few years yet. Let, no, I don't have the illusions How about long? that. How long, David? <laughs> My view is, and I think 2012 is a diversion, personally, mm -hmm. and I think you're going to see that exploited by Hollywood movies and other we things. See already? Yeah. Well, my, my feelings around 2016, life in this reality is going to transform.